Welcome. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the chair of the psychology department. Welcome to the third presentation in this year's psychology department speaker series. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker to you. Dr. Jeff Nevid is a professor and director of the doctoral program at St. John's University. Uh, Dr. Nevid did his undergraduate work at uh, SUNY Binghamham, and his uh, uh, PhD is from SUNY Albany. Um, he is um, a researcher uh, around the content that he's going to cover today, but also many of you probably know him if you are in a general psych class or took a general psych class in the last year, his name is on your textbook. So he is the author of your textbook um, and one area of scholarship that is important for him and big for him, and we had conversations about this at lunch today, is around the practice of teaching. So um, please welcome Dr. Nevid. Thank you, Frank, and thank you for the invitation to uh, talk to you today um, and for that lovely introduction, some of which, some of which was even true, uh, one of which is the, one of the truths, truths that, uh, that Frank mentioned is that, among other things, I am a textbook author, so uh, yes, I'm the guy that you get to blame uh, if uh, for some reason that you struggled with your intro psych class. Um, I teach at St. John's University in New York, and I've got to run back, uh, back to New York this afternoon, so I'm prepared to uh, meet my intro psych section at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, but I do have an ulterior motive. I want to get back to see what happens in the St. John's DePaul game tonight. If you follow uh, college basketball, uh, St. John's were probably better known for basketball than psychology, but. Uh, and we've had quite the run in the past week, having beaten uh, Duke and then beating uh, Villanova and, the, and then Marquette uh, in short order. So uh, got to DePaul tonight. I actually saw some of the team members at the airport, wish them well. Uh, I'll try to carry uh, the torch for St. John's here from the s standpoint of psychology. Don't ask me to shoot any baskets, so I <laughs> you'll be sorely disappointed. My talk today is going to be uh, what I call unmasking the Automatic mind. Let's talk about the human mind for a moment. Serious thought about, the nat about human nature itself and about the structure of the human mind can be traced back well before the origins of psychology, certainly to the time of the uh, ancient Greek philosophers, uh, if not earlier. If you take your philosophy courses, you may recognize these individuals. This is a uh, this actually is uh, a part uh, of a much larger work, uh, if you take art history courses, called the School of Athens. This is a fresco that's painted on the wall of the Vatican Museum in Rome. How many have been to the Vatican? And if you've gotten to explore the Vatican Museum and you go into the uh, Sistine Chapel and you look at that magnificent Michelangelo on the ceiling and all the and you remember that, it was, it was a wonderful experience and the, and the guards will hush you, right? You, can, you can't speak above a whisper because they're very sensitive. Well. And you can't take photos. But, but people often, and everybody will go and look at that magnificent work by Michelangelo on the, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But uh, if, you, if you venture through the museum on one of the side walls, you'll see what's called the School of Athens uh, by the Renaissance painter Raphael in which he depicts uh, representations of all the major philosophers of the period of, of ancient Greece. Uh, so I want to take a shot at that. Who is this gentleman here, the older gentleman? Who do you think that is? Faculty, no. Uh, <laughs> the faculty members here, notwithstanding, let's ask the students uh, if anybody recognizes. So throw it out, yeah. Uh, actually, no, but he actually was a student of Socrates, a very close student of Socrates. This guy, the younger man, is Aristotle. Thank you for that. And the older gentleman is his teacher, Plato. And what Raphael is representing, interestingly enough, uh, so systematic thinking about the nature of what makes us human goes back at least as this far. And Aristotle, shown here, he had uh, a conception of what it is that makes us uh, unique as uh, among all the animals that uh, walk the earth. Anybody know what that is, by the way? What Aristotle would say is the essence of the human being, the essence of human nature itself. 
the ability to reason. We are the reasoning creatures. Uh, interesting, Plato was pointing upwards. If you could see that, represented by Raphael, as if to say that knowledge is not going to be gained, uh, true knowledge, true knowledge that stands the test of time, that is enduring, it doesn't change over time. It's not to be found by using your eyes and observing the world around you because anything you observe in the world is going to change and it's changing still. And he says, no, it's the human mind where we're going to find true knowledge. Like, like <clears throat> the Pythagorean theorem, which you all learned in high school. You remember how that goes, don't you? How's that go? You remember? I'm sure you, it was drilled into you, into you at an early age. You know, I'll start you off and you can finish it for me. A squared plus B squared equals, go for it, go for it, you got it, C squared. Yeah. How did he come up with that idea? Did he measure every right-handed, right-sided triangle? No. It came from an insight that he had using the powers of reasoning. Uh, but Aristotle is going to be pointing at the world around us. He's, his, his, his arms, he's, he's looking, is this to say to Plato, yes, master, uh, we do learn from inward reflection in our pursuit of truth. But there's much to be gained by looking at the world around us, by learning about the tides and the animals and all the species uh, throughout the world. But these early representations of what human nature and the human mind is about emphasize the human being as the thinker, the reasoner. Uh, this is, anybody recognize this gentleman here? He's, we have to move ahead, we have to move the, the clock ahead about 2,000 years. Descartes, René Descartes, the French philosopher, um, who said, yes, what makes us human is the mind. Uh, we share bodies with other animals. Other animals have bodies that are mechanical things. But the mind is not a mechanical thing. It's of a separate order altogether. The ability to think, the ability to reason. And you recognize this here? A very famous piece of art, a sculpture. Anybody know what it's called? Thinker. The Thinker by the French sculptor Rodin. And so you see representations of what it means to be human, as, as, to, as to be the thinking animal, uh, the thinker. And for many centuries until, in fact, recent times, until the 20th century, this was the predominant view of, how the, of what makes us human, of our ability to think and reason. But these very ideas have been called into question, at first by this gentleman shown here. You recognize him. Most of you psychology students will recognize him. Sigmund Freud. But Sigmund Freud posited that it's not our rational self uh, that drives us and guides us and determines what we do. But there are stirrings from a, a, a deeper area of the mind he called the unconscious. And this is a, you could think of it as a kind of, uh, this area of the mind, it's a kind of subterranean uh, realm uh, where our impulses and urges live. And in fact, you could even liken it as he did to a battlefield because within the Within the workings of the unconscious mind, as he was to call it, there's a battle that's taking place within your very psyche at this very moment in time between impulses and wishes surging for expression. And he was to give a name to that, and he would call that the id. And it was there that we find our baser impulses, our sexual aggressive impulses. And they are surging for expression, and yet they are held down by an opposing forces of repression, as he called it, kind of tamped down so that we don't act out on our impulses. So either our sexual impulses or our aggressive impulses. We had a lovely lunch this, uh, this, just before coming here today. I thank you for that. It was delicious. You have a wonderful program here, this culinary program. Uh, that was a pleasant surprise. Uh, but when you go out to lunch with folks, you know, and you see somebody that's eating something that you happen to like, you don't just grab it off their plate and stuff your face with it. You've learned somehow to control those instincts, as Freud would teach. Uh, the human mind, to Freud, is composed of the conscious mind, which she says is rather trivial. It's basically what you're aware of at any moment in time. But there's a deeper area of the mind he was to call the unconscious. And in that realm, there's this battle taking place between the id on the one hand, striving to express these urges, the baser urges, the basic instincts, and the forces of repression that are controlled by another part of mind he was to call the ego. 
And it's very much like uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, it's a battlefield within the human psyche where these forces are battling each other. And he, could rep we, he represented it. He never used, by the way, the iceberg metaphor. You've seen it in your textbooks or you've heard about it in class. Uh, others have used the metaphor of an iceberg to represent the human mind. And in that human mind are these mental states he used to call ego it and superego, most of which lies in the subterranean basement of the human mind called the unconscious, below the level of awareness. And he was to say, the unconscious is beyond the, the reach of ordinary consciousness or awareness. You're aware of a, merely a sliver of your mental experience, he was to say, that which rises above the surface of the water, like the tip of an iceberg. And I, if I were to ask you, as I guess my own students, uh, what are you conscious of at this very moment? And that would be up here. This would be in the conscious self. It would be maybe listening to the sound of my voice, or maybe you. You know, you've got, you ate something for breakfast or lunch that's a little unsettled in your stomach and you're aware of that. Freud thought that was trivial. To Freud, what was really meaningful, what's going on down deep below in the recesses of the mind? But it's outside the range of awareness. So I would ask, I could ask you as I ask my students, you could tell me what you're, what's in your conscious mind. But can you tell me what's happening in your unconscious at this very moment in time? Think deep down inside. You know, you, you, that's no more accessible to you, what's happening, he would say, in your unconscious mind, as it would be for you to be aware of what's happening in your pancreas. Hey, pancreas, what's going on down there? You're pumping out that insulin? Hey, pancreas, wake up. I want to talk to you. So there are, there are parts of our mental experience, he would say, that go beyond our conscious awareness. And most people, when they think of the term unconscious, I'm not here to lecture you about Freud today, actually. I just want to use that as a kind of prelude. It's most people, when they think of the unconscious mind, this is the guy that they think of, and that conception of the mind is composed of these mental states or entities, the id, the ego, the superego, battling it out within the recesses of your inner self. Many psychologists today uh, have moved on from this Freudian view of how the mind works to a better, I think, a new, maybe even better understanding of what I would call, and want to share with you here today, I call it the automatic mind. So we move from Freud, just some quotes before we move on with this. Lots of people think, as you probably thought about, what it means, what the unconscious means. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had this to say. And we'll talk about unconscious bias. That's a real issue with us today. A physicist had this to say, a very prominent physicist, and the writer Stephen King, you may know, the popular writer of so many horror novels and the movies that were made based on them. The unconscious mind writes poetry if it's left alone. That's a very, I think, a, a very interesting way, a poetic way of thinking about uh, the workings of the unconscious. What I have to share with you today, whoop, back here, back here, back here, back here. Is that there's a new un unconscious. There's a, a new gunslinger in town. And we can call it, as I call it, the automatic mind. And it's uh, in, <laughs> in academic circles, it's having a major impact on our basic understandings, not just of psychology, but also of economics. I have here, as you see on the screen, this happens to be the current issue of one of the leading uh, professional journals in psychology. Uh, this is called The Observer. It's published by an organization called the American Psychological <coughs> Society, Association for Psychological Science, rather. And it's a representation of the fact, like Freud, that there is, in fact, within each of us, a bias beneath. Are we really rational? Uh, are we really thinking things that evaluate our experiences and come to, uh, uh, to some uh, understanding of ourselves in the world? Or do we, do we operate on a more basic uh, level, whether we call it intuition? or we call it a gut level reaction, or we call it, in this case, an underlying bias. And it's what I want to share with you today. What psychologists, are, and it's not just about what psychologists are learning, 
but you know, these sort of issues have become very prominent in our society of late. Oh, we, we all are biased. We all hold, our, hold certain biases, certain prejudices. Uh, we don't evaluate people based on the character, of, 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 based on the content of their character. But our first response to people is often by judging them based on stereotypes we hold about the groups that they represent, by judging people on their outward appearances. These are actually articles from the New York Times that are focused on what's called hidden bias. The roots of implicit bias. This became, uh, even was mentioned uh, by Hillary Clinton in one of the presidential debates uh, with Donald Trump. I remember this. Uh, you may, if you remember all the way back to 2016, the last presidential election. And there was talk about how, how um, police officers may have uh, hidden biases that will inf that influence how they re how they interact with members of the uh, minority community, and she talked about the fact that uh, we all have these underlying biases that are products, as I would say, of the automatic mind. It's not the thinking self that's involved. It's the tendency to judge people and act toward them uh, in in ways that uh, rely on stereotypes and basic prejudices. What is the automatic mind, as I call it? It's a different. <clears throat> First of all, it's a fast, non conscious form of mental processing. It allows us to do so many things. Uh, I don't want to paint it in negative terms, suggesting it's only about underlying biases. No. It's the automatic mind that allows you to walk, ride a bike, tie your shoelaces, type, among other things. Uh, it's a form of implicit memory, to use the technical term, that allows us to perform certain mechanical tasks without thinking about them. When you're walking, do you think about putting one foot in front of the other as you walk? Or try this, for example. I'm sure all of you are able to tie your shoelaces. I would wonder what would happen if you tried to explain to the person sitting next to you in words try to explain to her how you tie shoelaces, as if she's never tied them before. Would you be able to do that? Well, you want to try it? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm going to put you on the spot then. Not so easy, really. Because these are mechanical tasks that we've learned. Uh, that being a New Yorker, I'm, uh, I'm fond of uh, referencing certain uh, New York sports figures. Uh, the, ex, the, 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 the former manager of the New York Yankees, Joe Torre, used to call this muscle memory. It's muscle memory. It's not available to our conscious self. For example, how many of you, I'm sure most of you, know how to type? Okay, so what's the, you type often enough? You often type, you know, what's the letter on the keyboard that's next to the F, on the right-hand side of the F? That's G. Okay, good. Now, could you name all the characters in the line on that? Let's take a look at that. Oh, did I miss it? Sorry. My automatic mind is working too fast. I'm a pretty good typist, but I couldn't begin to tell you how the letters are arranged on the keyboard. I might, I might be, guess one or two of them. But I'm able to type. At least my fingers are able to type, making use of what we would call the automatic mind. Well, these are other examples, I would say, of the automatic mind. The ability of a, of a ball player to catch a fly ball. You know, they've actually done studies of this. I cite some in my textbook. That mathematicians have looked at that problem. How does a left fielder know where that ball is going to land so that he's, he or she is ready to catch it? In order to, in order to compute the trajectory of a hit ball, you have to know some very advanced geometry well beyond the understanding of most, most folks, especially most ball players, and myself included. How do they do it? Do they think it through? Well, I see what the arc of that ball is going to be, and I can project that that arc, given that velocity, will, the ball will land exactly at that spot. It's amazing what the mind is capable of doing automatically, without thinking. Riding a bike, here's another one if you want to try this. You know, uh, being a parent of two kids, one of the tasks you have as a parent is to teach your kids how to, how to ride a bicycle. I'm sure your parents helped you. 
Um, can you learn to ride a bicycle by reading a manual? Can you describe to your five or six year old, now son, I'm going to teach you how to, how to ride a bicycle. The first thing I want you to do, I mean, you could, you could give them some preliminaries, but when it comes down to it, they actually have to perform it, and you're going to have to be running alongside them to make sure they don't fall. And as, as they do that and they become able to master that very delicate balancing act, uh, that knowledge is gained at an automatic or implicit level. It's not something that can be reduced to words or put in a manual. It's not something that's available to ordinary consciousness. So I want you to understand there are two minds that we all possess. There's a verbal, evaluative mind that you're using now if you're trying to understand what I'm saying. And then there's an implicit mind, an automatic mind, an intuitive mind that's working on a very different level than your rational mind. Yeah, tying your shoelaces, riding a bike. And so the automatic mind allows us to do many things. It allows us to speak grammatically correct sense. You know that children learn the rudiments of grammar. You all did when you were two, three, four years, before you ever stepped foot in a classroom or before you ever had a first or second grade teacher, teacher teach you how to construct the proper sentence. You would, you would learn at a very early age to be able to say things like, well, uh, I went to the store rather than store I went to. Where did you learn that? Did somebody, your mom sit you down and teach you that? You learned it on the basis of hearing certain patterns in other people's speech. Just as you learned accents, by the way, if you think about it, accents, right? Did you make any ver uh, conscious effort to learn to speak in an accent? Do I speak in an accent? I often wonder about that. I'm a New Yorker. You can hear the New Yorker twang? All right. Well, I don't hear it. Accents is another way, a form of how the automatic mind works. It allows us to respond quickly to stimuli, to classify stimuli, and make judgments. It may even be the brain's earliest information processing system before the human beings ever developed the ability to think and express themselves and express their thoughts through the use of language. It may well have been that we had this more primitive basis of interacting with the world around us. Um, I said that uh, modern conceptions, contemporary conceptions of what we would call the unconscious mind or the automatic mind have uh, had a major, are having a major impact on some of our, our the subjects that we teach and our academic disciplines. Uh, there's one living Nobel Prize winner in psychology. You know about the Nobel Prize? It's the, it's the most uh, prestigious scientific uh, prize that goes to uh, leaders in their fields in medicine and, and economics and physics and chemistry and so on. And every year there's a they award this prize to a few select individuals around the world. And on a certain day, you see, on a certain day, when they make these announcements, they, they call the winners to let them know. And every year on that day, I wait for that phone to ring. And I wait. And I wait. I'm still waiting. But he didn't need to wait because the psychologist Daniel Kahneman from Princeton University, the only uh, Nobel Prize, living Nobel Prize winner in psychology, was awarded, there's no Nobel Prize, by the way, in psychology. He won it in economics. And the reason I bring him to your attention uh, is because he's one of those uh, pioneers who was studying the workings of the, un of the automatic mind. He won the Nobel Prize because, he, he, because of advancing a theory that people are not as rational as we think we are that our decisions are very often grounded not in a careful evaluation of the, of the facts at hand, but based on our gut impressions, we, based on our intuitions, based on our automatic responses. By the way, I do recommend this to you. This is a recent book that he's written. Uh, it's a good read. Um, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow, and in this book, Kahneman is arguing that there are two information processing systems in the human brain, one that works very fast, and we can call it intuition or the automatic mind, and the other that's a slower evaluative process, 
It's that slower process, what he calls uh, system two, that allows you to form evaluative judgments, to make comparisons, to, to evaluate your experiences. It allows you to analyze and synthesize information rather than just respond automatically. But my, my purpose here is to talk about system one, the automatic mind. There are other uh, popular books that have taken up this theme. Uh, these are some of the leading, biggest sellers in psychology in the past five or ten years. Uh, Mal Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, Sway, Predictably Irrational, and that's really what it's about, that we are less rational than we like to think we are. Uh, in some ways, we are even predictably irrational. Well, we'll get to him in a second. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure who the audience was going to be today. I, I thought there'd be uh, folks of my age or my generation. But I'm very pleased to see younger folks here. What I want to share with you in the f next few moments is th how the automatic mind influences what we do with our money. I say that uh, thinking about the automatic mind has, has, uh, has influenced uh, modern conceptions not only of psychology but of economics and finance. Any of you plan on going into a career in either economics or finance? Or but if you're not, even if you're not, you are concerned about your money, aren't you? Aren't you? Yeah, the heads go up and down. We're certainly concerned. Uh, we've learned that the workings of the automatic mind can lead even smart investors to make dumb decisions with their money. Now, I was expecting to see older, a number of older folks, and some are here, uh, because what I have to share with you may relate more directly to them, trying to manage their 401k plans, trying to manage their investments so that they, you know, they preserve that nest egg of theirs and grow it over time. I suspect that many younger people are not yet Enter the investment community. You, if you have spare money, you're not putting it into the stock market. Well, I might be wrong. But guess what? One day, the, the, I, can, I, I think this is a reasonable guess. The very fact that you're here today t teaches me that one day you may well have that money that you're going to invest and want to grow into a rather sizable nest egg. So if what I have to say to you in the next few minutes doesn't really relate to your experiences today, the very fact that you're in college, and developing yourself uh, further in your careers means that at some point going forward, you'll have some excess money that somebody's going to say, well, why don't you invest it rather than just keep it in the bank at 1% at interest? And so maybe something I have here to say might down the road <laughs> save you some money and a lot of aggravation that many people of my generation have experienced because there are certain traps, mental traps that we fall into by virtue of how the automatic mind works as, for example, Here's a typical investor, might look familiar, somewhat younger version. And here's a typical investor who's made dumb investment decisions. Well, the work of uh, Kahneman and his uh, colleague, uh, the, uh, Kahneman's an Israeli psychologist, uh, worked also with a, a colleague, Amos Tversky, recognized, and the reason he won the Nobel Prize is that he helped us on the better understand how investors are not guided by rational decisions, but rather by, very often, by irrational hunches, intuitions, and just wrong decisions based on what he called cognitive biases. So I'm going to share some of these with you. This is kind of a roadmap to what not to do with your money. So here are some examples of how the automatic mind can lead even smart people to make dumb decisions with their investments. Kahneman was to call this, and you read about it in your psych text as well, the representative heuristic. It's the tendency to make judgments or evaluations based on a small sliver of behavior that may not be representative of the larger universe of events or occurrences. And that's the fancy definition. But you've all experienced this. You know, even when it comes down to what movie to, if you're going out with your friends to, watch, to see a movie this weekend, and you happen to hear somebody on the elevator rave about a particular movie. Have you had that experience? And you say, well, I've got to see that. 
He said, you know, and you go to that movie and you walk out of that movie and it was a dud, and you're saying, so how could, you know, how could that person have thought? Because what you're doing is you're making a judgment based on a small sliver of one isolated occurrence of somebody, whoever, whoever it may be, and that the fact that it impressed that person doesn't necessarily mean it's going to impress people in general. Well, the same is true of how we work our investments. People may base their investment, but you know, if you go to the wrong movie and it's a dud, okay, so you're out, you know, a few bucks and a wasted evening. But if you invest thousands of dollars in a stock, in an investment, based on the fact that it's gone up a couple days in a row, expecting that's going to continue, that it's that, that movement in stock is representative of that stock's future performance. Well, you may find that, that you'll be sadly disappointed when it turns the other way. Uh, we should also recognize that we shouldn't uh, sell following bad news. We see something in the, in the paper about some bad news affecting a company, and all of a sudden we decide we're going to dump the stock. By the time you decide to dump the stock, all the smart, smart, all the seasoned investors are probably already pulled out. So you're probably going to sell it at even a lower level. And that stock may well bounce back because that bad news may not be fundamental to the stock's future prospects. And so we need to be aware of a tendency to rely on the, what the predictive value of current information. And as any stock, uh, stock broker or a professional will tell you, Past, it's almost a mantra in the investment community. You've heard this maybe. Past performance is no guarantee of future performance. So this is a psychological effect, this representative. So is the availability heuristic, Hahnemann calls it. The tendency to base our decision on what comes to mind. We make judgments all the time, not on a careful evaluation of all the evidence taking everything into account. But we very, very often make judgments based on whatever is in our mind, or what we've heard, maybe on the news, that very day. You know, for example, if there should be, God forbid, a plane crash, as it was in Russia just a few days ago, travel agents will tell you the next day people are canceling their reservations and, and losing whatever the deposits they've put down, left and right. They're basing their judgment, not on a careful evaluation of all the evidence, but whatever comes most readily to mind, what they heard on the news the night before. And that could also be something that gets us into trouble with our investments. Positive news triggers approach tendencies, and negative news triggers avoidance tendencies. I'm giving you kind of a, a how-to list, as it were. But it's not a how-to, it's how not to. It's, how, it's putting us on notice of these kinds of cognitive biases. We all have them. Even the most intelligent among us have these biases. They're built into us. But if being forewarned is being forearmed, so 10 years from now, 15 years ago, when you have that extra money to begin to put to work in the market, maybe you'll be aware of what this guy told you this afternoon back in your college days. A confirmation bias. And you read about this in your social psychology chapters or cognitive psychology chapters. This is the tendency that human beings, we all have, to stick to an initial hypothesis, even in the face of strong evidence inconsistent with it. This is a real problem in jury situations. Um, and attorneys know this for sure because they, they, they have to do what they can to guard against this. But even before the trial begins, Often from the very first sight you have of that defendant sitting in that defendant's box, you are forming an impression. You are making a judgment. You are forming a hypothesis. Yeah, he's guilty. I can look in his eyes and I can tell you. And whatever evidence is then presented, if it confirms your hypothesis, yes, that's what you bring to mind. But if it goes the other way, you tend to discount it, put it aside, because we tend to stick to our initial hypothesis, the stick to itiveness in the face of what is contrary information. And so if you, you know, invested in a stock and you really believe in that stock, that company, and its future prospects, despite the fact that all this negative stuff is happening, and you're reading about it day after day about what's happening to that company, 
The tendency we have is to stick to our initial impression regardless, and we have to be careful and on guard not to do that. Uh, investment professionals will tell you this all the time. The mental calculus that goes into people, that goes into comparing pain, uh, gains and losses. And it, it, you, if you've not yet invested, you haven't yet had this experience, but some of the folks here who have been investing, maybe over the years, you've certainly had this experience. It hurts much more to lose money than the joy that you gain from, from, uh, from making money. In fact, behavioral economists believe that the loss of a dollar is about twice as painful as the pleasure of a one. It hurts that much more to lose a dollar than to make a buck. Although it should be balanced, but in our minds, the losses outweigh the gains. As a consequence, people are averse to taking losses when stock decline. They can't face the reality of a losing investment. They said, actually, it's not a loss until you actually sell it. It's, it remains to that point only a paper loss. But when you, when you trigger a sale, right, then it becomes a real loss. And people are so averse to, to uh, losing uh, their hard-earned money that they will hold losers far too long and sell winners far too quickly to minimize this pain. The anchoring bias. Investors uh, very often, I was interviewed by CNN. You know, if you've watched any of the uh, commercial, I'm sorry, the cable uh, news, uh, rather finance channels, CNBC is one of the major finance channels. I was interviewed by CNBC about this very topic. The anchoring bias. The tendency of the automatic mind to form a mental judgment about a stock's value, not based on its real value, but based on a fixed price you have in your mind. You say to yourself that because I bought this company at, say, $20 a share, that's its real value. I'm going to wait for it to come. And if I've lost money on that. I'm going to wait for it to come back until it reaches that value. It may never reach that value. And you may be better off selling at 15 or 10 than letting it go all the way down to maybe even zero. Or this. <laughs> what that we knew what would have happened with Amazon when it was twenty dollars a share and it's now worth a thousand. But in our mind, we were not going to buy it because I could have bought it when. Well, I want to invest it now. I should have bought it then because that's what it's worth in my mind. That's called the. In other words, that price is anchored in your mind, not in reality, but in your mind. Uh, gut reactions, uh, the sense that you have a personal relationship with the companies in which you invest. And that we are somehow feel as if we are being personally uh, punished when stocks that we own begin to fall in value. Maybe it's an act of God. Maybe it's because of something I've done that I'm being punished for. You personalize something that is and a completely impersonal process. Put it another way. Stocks don't know that you own them. Stocks don't have any personal relationship with you. They go up and down, independent of whether you've led a good life or a bad life. But if you believe that it's a reflection on your self-worth, you may base decisions on whether you feel you are deserving of praise or punishment rather than the, the worth of the stock itself. There are a few more of these. Uh, I think I'll move on to this. I'll just mention this, and then we'll go on to some other things. But I want you to get a flavor for the fact that the way that economists are thinking these days and psychologists is that our decisions are very often guided not by rational thought processes, but by irrational biases and by characteristic ways of thinking. Uh, you take this, for example. The tendency of the automatic mind is to follow the crowd. When you take psychology, you read about the uh, classic work of the social psychologist Solomon Ash, who did work back in the 50s on conformity. You know, Ash, if you've taken Psych 1, you probably remember the name Solomon Ash, or taking it now. And he did studies on conformity. Do people follow the crowd, or do they stand up uh, on their own two feet and speak their mind? When S Ash actually began his studies on conformity, he believed 
in his heart of hearts that people were individualists, that they would, you know, that they would, that they would not conform just for the sake of blending in or fitting in. He was wrong. And his own experiments proved to him that he was wrong, that we as social animals tend to conform to a much greater degree than we think we, we do. Right? You think that you know, you're all, you're, you know, all your choices are guided by your individual needs and preferences. You wear your hair a certain way, you dress a certain way, you go to a certain school or not, or to a different school, because to what degree are those decisions and judgments influenced by the tendency we all have to conform? Because other people are wearing their hair that way, and other people are dressing that way, and other people are going to, to state because, well, you're going to state, the Spartans, because other people go to state, and of course you're going to state. Well, the same is true when it comes to what's called the herding bias. We tend to follow the crowd. If people are buying Amazon, we, Amazon or any stock, we pile on. Because if everybody else is doing it, we should be doing it too. But it's always worth considering. Uh, like lemmings to the sea, the herd can be drowned, as it was in 2008 when people lost more than 50% of their investments. And even last week, when if you follow the market just last week, it went up, it went down a thousand points, came back up, went down another thousand points. What's it doing today? I'll we'll have to check. Yeah, uh, if you rely on your emotions to, as the basis for making decisions, because it feels right to you, yeah, I really got a good feeling about Nike. I'm going to really invest in Nike. Watch out. Feelings should not guide your investment decisions. Leave them at the door when it comes to making sound investment decisions because they can guide you the wrong way. All right. I'm going to move on to psychology here. So I wanted to give you a flavor for how uh, thinking about the automatic mind is, is affecting our investment decisions. But there are many other ways in which uh, the automatic mind operates. The automatic mind and this is a model of, of how the brain processes fear. Uh, you, may you may have seen this in my own textbook or in other textbooks. It's a, it teaches us that, the, that there are two pathways in the brain that process fear-related stimuli. So if you're walking in the woods, as this young lady says, is walking in this, you're walking in the woods and you encounter the woods, is, 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 out of the corner of your eye, there's this crooked object. Now, it could be a stick or a twig of some kind, a branch that fell down, or it could be a snake. You know, um, how do you respond to that? Do you say to yourself, oh, that's interesting. Let me take a closer look at that. And that snake pops up and bites you. Now, we are programmed. Our brains are wired, hardwired, really, to take that signal whenever you see something that might be a threat, to take that signal and to send it down to an area of the brain, it comes in through the eyes, it goes up to a place called the thalamus, which is a, it's kind of a relay station in the brain. The thalamus is that part of the brain that works like a traffic cop. And so if you're a visual stimulus, it sends that stimulus back to the occipital cortex. You remember from chapter two? It sends it back to the occipital cortex for processing as a visual image. If it's an auditory stimulus, that traffic cop is going to send that stimulus to the temporal lobe where we process auditory signals. And so the signal comes to the thalamus, and the thalamus actually, according to this model by NYU psychologist Joseph Ledoux, he proposes that when that signal gets to the thalamus, it goes two different ways. There's a high road that brings it up to the cortex, the thinking centers of the brain, and there's a low road that goes down to the amygdala, a part a, in the lower, in the <laughs> deeper in the recesses of the brain, the amygdala, that's kind of like a sentry, always on patrol, always alert to any sign of danger. And that amygdala, even at this very moment, is on guard. So if I was to suddenly lunge at you, I'm not going to do it. You smile now, because you know I'm not going to do it. But if I was to, somebody was to suddenly lunge at you, even though you know it's, you know, this, a uh, rather mild-mannered professor sitting, uh, standing here, but still, your amygdala doesn't know that. When that signal, visual signal, then goes down to the amygdala, the amygdala treats that as a threat, and you cringe. 
you have an immediate fear response. That's a workings of the automatic mind. That happens without thought. That happens before thought enters the picture. That same stimulus goes up the chain of command to the cortex where your thinking center evaluates it and says, he's just playing, he's not a threat, he's just playing with me. And you smiled. That was your cortex thinking. But it takes a couple of seconds. And in those couple of seconds could spell the difference between, you know, an innocent, uh, brand, uh, innocent uh, uh, twig or a, a stick on the ground and a dangerous snake. And so we respond first in fear, a response that's pre-programmed in us, and we all have it, whenever we encounter a stimulus that looks threatening. And that's, again, the workings, thankfully, of the automatic mind, a part of the mind that works without conscious awareness. It only it takes a few seconds further for then the cortex to kick in and to evaluate it. How about this? How many of you, uh, if you may have seen this in my textbook, for example, but maybe not, um, how many have seen the FedEx symbol countless times? How many, have se how many have seen the hidden arrow in the FedEx? I'll put it another way. How many of you do have not seen the hidden? That's okay. You could, no, it's all right. No embarrassment. Have not seen. Should we help you out with this? You've all seen the symbol, the logo, any countless times to be sure. Uh, this is a kind of wow experience. It was for me when I first uh, learned of this because I wasn't aware of it, and so maybe you're not yet, but you know, once you see it, you'll never not see it. Should we help them out with this? Uh, who's struggling with this? Come on, we'll help you out with this. Are you struggling with struggling, struggling, struggling? Okay. Good. You're good with the shoelaces, but you're struggling with this. All right. That's okay. I'm so used to seeing the difference. Okay, so uh, can somebody help them out with this? Can you, can you've seen, you know where the arrow is? Who knows what, you know what the arrow is. Where's the arrow? Between the E and the X? Oh. oh this, did, I, did I get the wow? <laughs> I live for that. I really, you know, I, I live for that, that wow. I got the wow, or oh, okay, thank you. In other words, there's your arrow, right? It's in white. Uh, you see it, if you see that arrow is set against an orange background. But typically the way we, we perceive the logo is that we see the colored elements of the figure as the figure set against a white background. If we look at it that way, and we very often will typically look at it that way, we don't see the hidden arrow unless we reverse the relationship between figure and ground. And I mention this because the ability to perceive figure-ground relationships is, a, is, is part of the workings of the unconscious mind. We're not thinking about it. You're not looking at that and saying, well, should I treat the white as the background against which the color, or should I treat the colored parts of that, that object as the foreground against the white background? You're not thinking it through. You are responding to it automatically. By the way, Dan Brown, you read Dan Brown? You like Dan Brown? The Da Vinci Code, among others, his latest work. I read this recently. If you read Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, you read this one, Art. Uh, his most recent work, he actually talks about this, about the hidden arrow toward the end of the book. Uh, but I was surprised he doesn't explain it. He just kind of dumps it there and, and moves on. Uh, I expected he would explain it. Figure ground effects are, there are these implicit messages around us, like the hidden symbol there. By the way, another, a work, the, another example of the workings of the automatic mind is what psychologists call classical conditioning. You all learned about classical conditioning, am I right? Pavlov and his dogs. I'm not gonna go through this. When I teach and write about classical conditioning, actually, I don't start with this. Students tend to tune this out when they see this. We get to it, but we tend to tune this out. I don't start with this. I, I actually, I don't even start with Pavlov and his dogs or this dog and collecting the saliva. We're all familiar with that paradigm or should be. Now what I start with is the fact, well, there it is, wait. I hate eggs. I hate the smell of them. I hate the sight of them. And the runnier they are, the more disgust I have. It's not just a distaste. It's an aversion. And if we were to go to lunch, as we did, thank you for that, and somebody were to order an omelet or something or runny eggs, I wouldn't say anything. 
but I hope you wouldn't take it the wrong way if I kind of back away a little. Uh, don't take it personally. I hate eggs. I, I, I start with that because, you know, um, I wasn't born that way. My mom told me that as a young lad, I very happily ate my eggs. Something happened along the way. This was a learned behavior. I can't recall those early conditioning experiences in which I developed what's called a conditioned taste aversion. By the way, as I do this with my students, I could do this here. To me, it's eggs. And it's not just a distaste. It's an aversion. It's a conditioned response. And conditioned responses are learned reflexively. They are elicited. They are, work, they are products of the unconscious or automatic mind. Anybody else? What kind? I'm always curious to know. Anybody have these kinds of taste aversions? For me, it's eggs. What might it be for you? Sweet potatoes. Innocent little sweet potatoes. But that, get, that, that really disgusts you. Were you always like that, or was there something along the way? Uh, there was something along the way. I remember this one specifically. I think it was about five years ago now. Uh, my mom had created like a whole plate of them for us to try just like seaweed for the sweet potatoes. Yeah. And then the taste of them just wrecked. Um, it was spoiled or something? Rotten? No. no? no it wasn't Mm -hmm. it, but does it make you really sick to your stomach? Are you really repelled? I want to get at that feeling that it's really a, an aversion. Okay, you and me both. Yeah. Scallops. Scallops. You have bad experience with them? I've broken them. Okay, th I'm glad you raised that because um, they may be, you may have dislike for certain kinds of foods. But it makes me like sick to my stomach. Okay, interesting. So it may actually be an aversion. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Really sick to your stomach. Okay, so you invite this guy over. Don't serve Frank's hot sauce. <laughs> That's what I learned. Yeah, good, good example. Thank you. Uh, the idea that uh, our, and I move now to consumer behavior, to what we purchase, to marketing. I asked before if maybe you can go on to a career or an interest in finance or economics. Some of you. I suspect that many of you go on to career in marketing. You may not think of it that way, but you'll be selling stuff. You'll be trying to get people to buy the stuff you're selling, whatever you're going to be doing. And that's applied psychology, by the way, marketing. Back in the 1950s, there were influential books that talked about this in particular, The Hidden Persuaders, that talked about the hidden motivations that drive people to buy what they buy. I want to talk a little bit more about this. Ernst Dichter was, uh, Ernest Dichter was one of the pioneers of this uh, motivation research, as it was called. And when you take your marketing classes, uh, if you should go into business or take courses in marketing, you'll learn about Dichter and Vance Packard. One of the things that Dichter was to say, for example, a famous maxim of Dichter was, you know, if you're selling shoes, you're not selling shoes. You're selling pretty feet. Remember that. And so there are underlying motives that we have to, to, if we're going to be effective marketing or sales that we have to connect to. Well, I'm going to talk to you about some work I've done using a test called the Implicit Association Test or TASK. Uh, you could look this up online. There are tens of millions of people who have already taken the IAT, as it's called, uh, Project Implicit. Uh, if you Google it, uh, you can test your own hidden biases, your own racial biases, your own gender biases, and many other kinds of biases, weight biases. And what this does basically is that it's a reaction time task. It's measuring your reaction time. You get to sort. It's a sorting task. And so it says when a word comes up or a picture of a white person or a bad word comes up, you hit one key on the keyboard. If it's a black or good stimulus, you hit another key on the keyboard. And then they reverse. And the idea is that if you pair black and good versus white and bad, and you get faster reaction times, 
through white paired with good than white paired with bad, and black paired with bad versus black paired with good, that suggests that you may have what are called implicit biases. Because when this is primed, when you see a black face, if you have these underlying biases, you're going to be slower at, at sorting out good and bad words. Because you have a tendency to associate bad words if you have these kinds of biases. And so when a police officer is in a, uh, a situation where a suspect you know, may be flashing a gun, you can see how these kinds of racial biases can lead to, oh, what a terrible and tragic results. Will that police officer be more likely to pull his own gun if that person that he's seeing is white than black? Uh, the developer of the IAT, uh, I won't spend much time here, I'll move on from here, but is a gentleman named Anthony Greenwald, and he's just won. As I say, this, uh, this movement toward recognizing the uh, significance of the automatic or unconscious mind is really taking hold not only in economics but also in psychology. Anthony Greenwald, University of Washington, developed this test and is a leading expert in this area. He was re recently given the highest scientific award that APA or American Psychological Association can bestow. Uh, this gentleman is the most recent Nobel Prize winner, Richard Thaler. He is what's called a behavioral economist in the tradition of Daniel Kahneman. He looks at irrational uh, economic decisions, what people do not just with their investments but also with their, their everyday purchasing behavior and how that's influenced by underlying biases. Just won the Nobel Prize based on his work. He's written a wonderful book called Nudge, Nudge, I should say, Nudge, Nudge, that I recommend to you. There it is, Nudge. Proving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness, Nobel Prize winner Richard Thaler. Let me tell you about a nudge and how this comes into play in our regular lives. I use this in my textbook as an example. Clean scent, clean hands. It's an actual study that was done uh, in a hospital in Florida where they wanted to encourage people, nudge them, into using the hand sanitizers. And so they put the hand sanitizers outside the, uh, the, the patient, uh, a patient ward where patients were being treated. And visitors, as they came by, they wanted to encourage them to use the hand sanitizer before they entered the, the medical unit. But what they did unbeknownst to people, you're walking by, you're visiting your sick relative in the hospital, and you're about, and at, the, at, the, at the door, uh, that you need to enter to, 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 to get to the patient's rooms, there's this hand sanitizer. Do you use it? Can we get you to use it? Can we nudge you? What they did was to, unbeknownst to them, to infuse a clean citrus smell in that area of the hospital. As it turned out, that people that were exposed to that citrus smell more often wash their hands, use the hand sanitizer. They also wanted to see would people respond to this observing set of eyes. We're watching you. Are you going to use the hand sanitizer before you walk into the hospital ward? Turns out that people responded more to the stern-looking male eyes than to the gentler-looking female eyes. We are all prone to these kinds of implicit responses, unconscious responses, unbeknownst to us. I'll tell you about some of my own research. might be of interest to you. Me and my apple. It's curious. I mean, uh, you probably all have uh, computers or laptops. How many of you use Apple, com apple computers? How many use PCs? We got a, okay, so we've got a mix. Uh, if, a few years back, and maybe you remember this, uh, there were a set of commercials about the Mac guy and the PC guy. Remember those? As for example, the whole series of these. You remember the Mac guy and the PC guy? How many remember the Mac guy and the PC guy? Hello. Whoop. Gesundheit, you okay? No, I'm not okay. I have that virus that's going around. 
Oh, yeah. In fact, you better, you better stay back. This one's a doozy. That's okay. I'll be fine. No, no. Do not be a hero. Last year, there were 114,000 known viruses for PCs. PCs? Not Max. So, you just grab this one. Hey, I think I got a crash. Hey, if you feel like that'll help. Good. Hello, I'm a Mac. Okay, and I'm a PC. Do you want to be this guy or you want to be this guy? You want to be the fuddy-duddy guy? You want to be the cool dude? Uh, this was one of the most successful uh, advertising campaigns in the history of advertising. Again, applied psychology called marketing. You remember that? You remember these types? of? This is one of a series. Uh, so I got to thinking, you know, are there personality differences between Mac users and PC users? You know, are Mac users cooler, hipper people? Uh, do they have pers different personality traits? We tested it out. In my university, we have a program which every incoming student uh, is not given a computer. You know that's part of the tuition. It's included in their tuition. You should know it's not a gift. But they get to choose whether they want a Mac or a PC. And like my classes, like here, about half of them chose PCs, half chose Mac. I was wondering, are their personality? And I was also wondering, does this operate at an unconscious level? Are you somehow more psychologically connected or identified with a Mac than you are, would be with a PC? And we tested it out. Uh, we measured them in terms of their personality traits. And we also put them through an IAT, an implicit association test, to measure their implicit responses. Basically, I was looking to see whether the P Mac owners were more psychologically uh, 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 or, or, or identified with their Macs. That a Mac was not simply something, a, a computer they used. It was part of them. They were attached to those Macs. It was, a, it was somehow part of their collective identity as opposed to PC. So we put them through both a personality test and we put them through a, um, a set of tested their implicit responses. Whoops. Slideshow, current slide. Sorry. Well, we'll get to this guy in a moment. So what do you think? Are there personality differences between Mac users? Some of you raised your hand, you're Mac users. Uh, your personality is different than the person sitting next to you that's a PC user. Does it correspond to those guys, the cool guy? Does it? What do you think? Actually, no. Couldn't find any personality differences between Mac users and PC. But what we did find, at an implicit unconscious level, we showed that Mac, unit, Mac owners were more personally identified with their Macs and PC users were PC users were with their with their machines. In other words, for a PC user, PC user, what a PC user or owner. You know, they, they like the features of the computer, they use the computer, it's a tool. It's not part of who they are. But Mac owners, as we find in our research, are more psychologically identified. The iPhone, the Mac is part of who they how they see themselves. Somehow Apple, brilliant as they are, are able to pull this off, that they created a product. It's not just something that you find useful, but something you psychologically identify with. But I wouldn't know. I'm a PC user. By the way, when I was interviewed about this article, the guy who was interviewing me, uh, he said, you know, he turned around to me and says, so what kind of phone do you use? As it happened it was a few years ago, I was using an iPhone at the time, so I said iPhone. But I said, I also use a PC. So, you know, I just wanted to balance that out. Now I'm back to an Android. Recognize this guy? Are you more likely to trust the guy on the left or the guy on the right? Back in 2008, I, I, I conducted a study to measure implicit responses toward images of Barack Obama when he was running for president for the first time. And uh, the reason that I was interested in this was because I noticed during the campaign that there were some newspaper articles and magazine features in which the image of Obama was markedly darker 
than in other images. Some were lighter, some were darker. And I began to wonder, would that affect how voters would respond to Obama as a candidate? And so we decided to do, <coughs> pardon me, an IET study. We decided to test out to see if people had different implicit responses of, to what we might now term skin tone prejudice. Now we'd like to think we're above all this, right? We'd like to think that we're making an evaluation based on the content of his character, not on the darkness of his skin. But like Solomon Ash, we could be wrong. And so we had students like yourselves, intro psych students, and we tested them out. Uh, we put them in conditions in which some of them saw this image and some of them saw this image, and they then sorted out good and bad words. And we measured their implicit biases. And then we did one other thing, which was, I'm glad that we did, because it allowed us to, dr to drill deeper and dig deeper into the data. We had students identify themselves as either being conservative or liberal. And what we found, uh, in my mind, is somewhat shocking and concerning. We didn't find any difference in implicit responses, no evidence of bias for lighter images of, of Obama between conservative and liberal students. It was a wash. But when we darkened the image, the same image, just darkened, conservative students showed a more negative bias than liberal students. And that, I think, is very concerning. So your own political attitude can affect your implicit responses in ways that can affect how you vote and how you respond to uh, images like these. Uh, a few more things and we'll call it a day. Um, other implicit responses, I just kind of want to raise your awareness about this stuff is happening in our everyday experiences all the time. We just don't process it like this. Evidence shows us, guess this, that people tend to post more gloomier or more negative post, post Facebook postings when it's rainy outside than on sunny days. You can actually tabulate that. We're affected by atmospheric conditions by the weather itself. People feel cheerier in the spring than the winter. That's a well-established scientific finding. Even how a room is lit affects such things as food. Oh, there's a culinary institute here. Take it to heart. How well the room is lit can affect how something tastes. Exposure to bright light, it's been shown, increases preferences for spicy food. This is not happening at a conscious level. This is happening at an automatic or unconscious level. Bright light may intensify emotional responses, either positive or negative. If we raise the lights, you're going to, if you're angry, you're going to be angrier. If you're sadder, you're going to be sadder, positive or negative. Lighting affects us. The temperature affects us. What does the nose know? The nose is also responding implicitly. I use these examples in my textbook as well. Uh, this is a recent, a relatively recent study. Uh, men who are sniffing a, women's, a woman's tears turns, a bit, turns out to be a sexual turnoff, even if the woman is not present. I mean, if a woman is crying in your presence, you could understand that that could be a sexual turnoff. But if you, as a male, are exposed just to her tears, and she's not there, but you're just sent sniffing her tears, that has an effect on your sexual arousal and sexual interest. It's a downer. All right, do you want to try this after, after our talk, uh, get together here today? Volunteers? Uh, men who sniff an ovulating woman's t-shirt showed higher levels of the sex hormone testosterone. Then did men exposed to control t-shirts of non-ovulating women? We are being influenced by these subliminal Sub unconscious types of responses and, and cues all the time. We may not be processing it or aware of it. And not just what goes for men goes also for women. Women, yeah, they've done studies of this. I mean, <laughs> would you volunteer for one of these studies? Women exposed to male sweat tend to feel more relaxed. They actually feel more relaxed afterwards. They don't know they're, they're actually being exposed to male sweat. They're just asked to sniff certain substances, control substances, and turns out one of the substances is male sweat. And the women that were exposed to it said they felt more relaxed. What's going on? It's not conscious. These are unconscious 
reactions we have to various kinds of stimuli. Okay, I'm going to end. So I've given you kind of things to think about of how the new, our new concepts of the unconscious mind influence so many different aspects of our behavior. What we purchase, what we do with our investments, who we may even vote for, whether we buy a PC or Mac, many of these things are influenced at a deeper unconscious level. I'm going to share something with you. I, was, I thought it was going to be mostly faculty and I wanted to, to share this with them and some faculty here, but I'll, what the hell, I'll share with the students as well. So this is you know, basically for the faculty that are in the room. You may find this, and the students as well. Three common problems instructors often face. Students don't come to class. Am I right, faculty? Sometimes? They come late to class, am I right? Even here? Or are you all perfectly punctual? And this, <laughs> nodding off inattention. Hey, look, I've, you know, I've been teaching long enough that I certainly know, as all instructors know, that these are common problems uh, that we face in the classroom. And I'm going to offer faculty members a suggestion. It's not an implicit suggestion, I'm making this explicit. This is something that I do in the classroom uh, that I've been talking about to faculty groups around the country and, and people are really picking up on it. It may be helpful to you and, and even to students someday, even if you te become a teacher or you might suggest this to some of your instructors. I don't have a panacea, any, a cure that I can offer for these three comments, but I can offer a suggestion that I find very helpful. I call it the mastery quiz. And I do this in my introductory psychology classes. A mastery quiz is a kind of pop quiz. And I know those are the most hated words in a student's vocabulary, pop quiz. But these are quizzes students actually like. And what we do is, in class, is I pop a question up on the screen, very first thing. Very first thing. And it's on, it's going to be a question based on a topic I'm going to be talking about that class. Right? Uh, at, what makes this different and makes it a mastery quiz is that students have the opportunity to, to answer the same question twice, at the beginning of class and at the end. And they get credit if they get the right answer either at the beginning or the end or on both occasions. They get a credit that goes toward their final grade. So if you didn't know the answer walking in, you're going to know the answer if you pay attention walking out. And so what this does is it uses psychology to teach psychology. It creates incentives that what are the incentives? You have to be in it to win it. You have to be in class that day to earn that credit. This is an in-class quiz. You have to be on time to take the pre-quiz. And you have to pay attention if you didn't know the answer because only through paying attention you'll learn, you learn the answer. And we find that this helps students grasp the concepts that we're trying to teach, at least the one concept here that we are targeting. Mastery quizzing is an effort to uh, provide incentives for coming to class, coming on time, and paying attention. I want to thank you for your attention, in, in either conscious or unconscious-wise. It, it's been fun. Thank you all. Thank you.